and uh, welcome everyone to this episode of Totally Unscripted. So um, I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, Wakar Ahmed, who, who's uh, been uh, a long time contributor to the Google Apps Script community. Perhaps gone a bit quiet <coughs> recently, but it's great to see him come back uh, quite quite loud, vocal, and um, doing um, continuing his his track of doing really interesting stuff. So uh, welcome, Wakar. Just to quickly go through a couple of bits and pieces. So, as I mentioned, the the main news item is the um, app verification. We'll come back to that. So, however, the only other piece I, I thought we would just highlight is community contribution. So, um, uh, the thing that really caught my eye recently was um, something that Bruce McPherson had um, has been testing the water with. Um, so he's looking at um, people if they're interested in joining a register of AppScript consultants. So on the Google Plus community, there is a, a dedicated, um, uh, you know, looking for a consultant uh, tab within the community. Um, but uh, Bruce is um, putting together a slide deck, and you can follow the, the link to that post, and we'll publish the slides uh, for this session uh, after the show. Um, so if you're um, developing AppScript uh, commercially and um, you just want to get your name out there, then uh, follow Bruce's link and um, follow the instructions there. Hi there, and uh, welcome everyone to this episode of Totally Unscripted. So um, I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, Wakar Ahmed, who, who's uh, been uh, a long time contributor to the Google Apps Script community. Perhaps gone a bit quiet <coughs> recently, but it's great to see him come back uh, Quite, quite loud, vocal, and um, doing, um, continuing his his track of doing really interesting stuff. So, uh, welcome, Wakar. This is um, a fascinating talk. I I think you'll find um, that Wakar is going to give us in a second. So, um, Wakar is talking about uh, intelligent conversational apps um, using API.ai, which is a Google service. So, rather than um, Stealing all Wakar's thunder, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Wakar, and uh, take us through it. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, I welcome all of you uh, to the show. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, uh, intelligent conversational apps with Google Apps Script and API.ai. So the agenda for the Apps Script uh, for this uh, session is I will first. Uh, briefly introduce what is API.ai, and then I will uh, discuss about API.ai webhook, which we will use in the, with Google Apps Script. And then I will explain how we can make Google Apps Script web, as, uh, web app as a API.ai webhook. And then I will go through some codes uh, so that uh, you get to know how I have implemented it. And then I will go to the demo and then explain that demo how I Set up that demo with uh, uh, with Apps Script and API.ai. So, what is API.ai? So, API.ai is basically a conversational user experience platform by Google, which enables branch unique natural language interactions for devices like Google Home Assistant, or you can make applications and uh, and services uh, using this API.ai platform. So machine learning allows your API.ai agent to understand a user's interaction as natural language and convert them into structured data or in API.ai terminology. Uh, your agent uses machine learning algorithms to match user requests to specific intents. Uh, API.ai automatically matches what the user wants to say and then uh, extract the entities to, and relevant data from the, from the user input. Okay. So in API.ai, we use webhook to, uh, to integrate the API.ai agent with third party services. So when you set up an API.ai webhook, uh, it allows you to pass the information from the uh, managed intent, intent into a web service and then get a result from it. Okay. So, in this case, we will use Google Apps Script web app as a web service with API.ai webhook. Apps Script web service as an API.ai webhook. 
you, uh, apps script content service we can uh, turn the apps script web app into a, a web service so uh, when someone calls this web service uh, the web service returns data to the caller this on the request and also we know that the con content service works on a temporary redirect whenever you request uh, for some data to the apps script web service which uses content service it will automatically redirect to a google user content.com url temporary url so which is different url than the uh, api url so the problem is that uh, api.ai webhook does not follow the redirect so you cannot integrate api.ai with apps script service directly so i came out came out with a work around a web proxy so i made this web proxy using google app engine you can use google cloud function also in this case but i used google app engine uh, <clears throat> so you see that the api dot agent and apps script service is google apps app engine proxy so what it does basically when uh, it gets the request from the api dot ai agent post request so and along with the post request it sends a header web app url header with the web app url so that the proxy knows where it has to forward the request so uh, in the web app url uh, in, the, in the web app url header we write the access service uh, url and then uh, this is uh, forwarded to the you see that uh, this is forwarded to the uh, google api proxy this is forwarded to the uh, access script service so after that a uh, cris root uh, access script web service receives the data it process process the data and returns the response uh, by a 302 redirect to the google api engine proxy and then google app engine proxy returns the data to the returns the response to the api dot ai agent so this was this is the total setup uh, in order to make the api dot ai agent talk to the apps script web service so this is the gi proxy code uh, here i receive the web app url header and then as google api proxy makes a request to the web app url which is received in the header and all the payload is forwarded to the uh, this web app url whatever is received from the web app url this is returned to the google app engine google app engine response as a google app engine response and it is returned back to the api.ai agent so uh, this is the public link for for the App engine proxy. So this is the file for the proxy. So this is uh, you can go to this uh, URL and then find the code for the proxy. So I am back to the presentation, and then this is app script web service code. Here I received uh, data from the Google App Engine proxy as a post request. So I use here as a two post as an entry point. Here I get the content which is sent by the Google App Engine proxy. And then I receive the structured data which is uh, which is received by the uh, API.ai agent. If you go to the API.ai uh, documentation, you will see that you will see that it has come from this form. Uh, uh, this, Format here in this object is result object, and under the parameters, all the inputs which you have extracted from the users uh, users in users language. So this will come under the parameters. So I use this uh, result parameters in the Google app in the access script proxy. So I receive it here, and then I process this, uh, process the data. Which is uh, received, and then I return the response to the uh, Google App Engine proxy. Google App Engine proxy, which is then uh, returned back to the Google API dot AI agent. So let us take a look on the demo. So first, I will go to API dot AI console and show you what is the setup in the API dot AI. This is a simple uh, board which uh, 
uh, using uh, from which book from which uh, a user can interact and book an appointment to the owner of the board okay so here i made an uh, book appointment and these are the text what uh, what the user might say based on the based on this text uh, api dot ai agent will know that uh, the person wants to uh, book a meeting and then these are the entities uh, which are required from the user in order to book an appointment so this is the date time and the name of the user, name of the person and then email email id of the person so if this doesn't provide the uh, any of these parameters so there will be a questions like what, what should be the prompts on the board so here i have defined the prompts like if the date is missing then board will say to have a date in mind or when do you want to meet similarly for time if there is, uh, first it will ask for date when there is a date then it will say what time on that date okay so it will ask, ask the user like this so this is how we extract the input from the user so so and uh, other is access script web service which i have set up i go to the i go through the code here so in this case the request is received in the new post and then the post content is just extracted which is then sent to the server function and then from here i i get the user user input structured user input and from that input i get the date and then i make it as a start date and end date time as a half an hour slot on my calendar from the time when the user has requested okay so it's like uh start time and i have made it made here and then the using calendar app i am making uh, creating a event and then uh, the user uh, the i ask i add the person as a guest in that uh, in that meeting and then access to web service returns the response that thank you and the name i have booked your appointment you will receive a mail notification so this was this was a very simple setup Uh, just to show you how you can integrate the apps script web service with api dot ai agent so i will go to go to the demo now so i go to the integrations uh, for uh, quick uh, quick integration is the web demo which is built in the api dot ai so i will open that demo I'll make the screen smaller so that it looks like a chat box. Say, I want to say here, I want to meet. So, uh, uh, API dot AI agent automatically knows that you want to do a meeting. So, it asks for do you have a date in mind. So, I say yes. on next so it knows that uh, on 10th august that is the next thursday so what time on next thursday i say 11 am may know your name so i say it has your email id i say now the interact is interacting with the, dot ai web service and then request was sent to the access uh, access service and the response is written from the access service so it says thank you i have booked your appointment you will receive a mail notification shot in your mailbox so let us check uh, let us check my calendar so i'll go to calendar.com So the appointment was put on 10th August. I will go to 10th. Go to 10th August. You see that there is a meeting in the thing. If I go to the detail of the event, you see that the meeting is added as guest here. So this was the demo about how to integrate a script web service with API. So. this was it about the uh, integration of as a script with api.ai so thank you
that's impressive stuff. <laughs> um, so, well, <laughs> like I've got many questions and comments. But I wonder, uh, we've got Steve and Jonathan, if, if they've got anything. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, very impressive. It's, it's interesting how you had the problem of the redirect, and you're able to think through that. Yes. In this case, leverage uh, Google App Engine. And I believe you said it's possible to choose another option, like maybe um, uh, Cloud Functions. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. Yeah, you can use any web service. Uh, you can use any platform which just receives a HTTP request and then forwards the request to. Uh, to another URL and then receive the request and returns the data on the same URL as requested by the API. Okay. Yeah. So was, any service, yeah. it can be any PHP web service or app engine or cloud function. It, yeah. It's up to the person who, who is going to implement. Yeah, it's very well done. So, so thank you. I think one of the impressive me things for me is that there wasn't really any noticeable lag. Um, so I'm imagining as you're collecting the individual pieces of information, it's not needing to interact with App Script. It's only once it's got everything. But even when it got everything, it, it didn't take long for that uh, response to come up. So uh, are you finding it's, you know, even with the having to do a proxy redirect that it's not affecting uh, the user experience? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, actually, when I was testing initially with, when I was directly integrating with App Script, uh, all the time, uh, response was coming like uh, the response from the access script is empty. All the time comes like two zero six error, empty response. I, I noticed there when you're going through your demo as well that um, the API um, dot AI basically allows you to do a, an iframe embed of the of the chatbot. So um, that makes it very straightforward in terms of. You know, if you were wanting to do something with the uh, in an add-on or in the sidebar, or um, you know, yeah, actually right, right, right. Yeah. In yes. interacting with them, something yeah, very straightforward. I suppose the the challenge is is um, designing. You know, instead of a kind of um, a kind of a graphic user interface, you're you're now having to think about a vo voice user interface, and you know, constructing those prompts and those questions, but it looks like the API.ai service, you know, helps you a lot in terms of being able, you know, you still need to enter a lot of bits and pieces, but it, yeah, exactly. it takes a lot of the headache out. Yes, actually it does two things. Uh, the one thing is the natural language processing. And the other thing is, other thing is speech recognition. Uh, if you see in this agent, uh, I think I should. I will share my screen again. Integration by mobile Google. That is, that is also having a mic icon here. So you can uh, converse with this app directly, or you can embed this app in an iframe somewhere in your sidebar or some add on. Okay. So, so, yes. so, so you can do voice and input as well. Steve, is this um, sending your cogs whirring in terms of what, what you might be doing? With some of your add-ons, yeah, especially since you know how add-ons you can have a dialogue over your document or form or yeah. spreadsheet, but we have the nice sidebar. And as you pointed out, it's interesting that you can, you know, fit right there in the sidebar to have a natural language experience to interface with your data, either by typing or voice. So it does create some ideas. <laughs> so I mean, we'll, we'll see where this goes. Yeah. It, it's nice that you know you, you've got the benefits of Google Apps Script where you've got all these services and you know even the ones that aren't in the box in terms of you know calendar and uh, you know the whole the whole list of maps and things like that. Um, it's so easy to plug into these services, and that, that's what one of the things I, I really liked about your demonstration was you you know you were able to create you know a calendar event very quickly. Um, within a couple of lines of code um, from the data that you got yeah, back yeah. from API.ai. So there's a, a lot of scope there uh, in terms of what you, you can do. We'll move on to um, app verification. So um, this is something that recently came out um, from Google. Um, so th there's basically 
uh, as a result of um, a couple of high profile uh, phishing uh, exploits that are using Google Apps Scripts, um, Google have tightened up um, basically how how things work. So you'll uh, and quite a few people have um, posted um, scratch heading mo moments in the Google Plus community. So previously, when you were using uh, you know, you you deployed a web app or an add-on, um, or you, you know, you had something container-bound within something like a Google Sheet. Um, if you use scope, so if you were calling services, um, then that would prompt basically the the authentication flow, so that the user would have to um, select their uh, their Google account and and give permission for that. Um, what Google have done is actually tighten this up to um, now they've, they've got a whole verification layer in that. So if your application is using certain scopes and um, it, it uh, um, needs verification from the user, uh, unless you've had your app verified, you're going to get this kind of um, uh, HTTPS certificate failure type dialogue. Uh, where the only way to proceed is uh, quite scary. You have to click on advance and you have to click on the unsafe option. You have to type something in. Um, so this has created quite a few headaches for, for people in the community. So uh, there's documentation on that. But we thought we'd just um, delve a bit deeper into what, it, what you know, how you can prevent getting the app verification dialogue um, coming up, so either through verification process or just looking at how your script is coded uh, and some of the other implications. So there's more documentation. So um, it's probably worth just spending a time, uh, a moment, just to mention uh, where we are with add-ons. So, um, so as, uh, with add-ons. There was already a publication process uh, in place, um, so verification has been integrated into that. And Steve, I think you mentioned earlier that you you had a, an app go through uh, add-on verification, uh, and it, it was okay for you. Your your experience was okay. Yeah, um, just this week I had a client that was very complex add-on, and I thought, okay, I I prepared my client to say, we'll have a to-do list of items to, to fix, and then we'll just go finally get it approved. But to my surprise, it was um, accepted, approved without any to-do items. So I guess we you know just follow the best practices uh, that it's on the online documentation that Google add-ons have, and make sure you have your privacy policy set. And if you check off all those items, you can expect uh, maybe a a nice uh, experience with the with the uh, process of getting it approved. Um, you do have something listed on your slide that um, I did follow up with Google on, and they added that portion, that last paragraph you have that says add-ons that are published to a limited set of users or domains. I just wanted to uh, clarify that a little bit more, if I could. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay, so sure. If, you, if you imagine if you go into your script editor, you click Publish, and you have choices. And you, in this case, if you click a web app as an add-on, or you publish as an add-on. When you finally get to kind of like the Chrome Web Store area, uh, near the end, uh, you have an option to say public uh, within, I think, my domain, uh, uh, unlisted, maybe to a group. Well, if you click public, the existing process that I just described moments ago kicks in, right? Uh, however, um, if you do click something that's not public, then you may experience this verification thing. So they basically are recommending if you're uh, having an add-on um, that's not public, you may have an issue maybe within your domain, hopefully not, but if it's unlisted uh, link, then you may have this verification issue, in which case you should go through the verified app process by filling out the form. So that's why I wanted to clarify on that. That's um, a very, very useful point, um, Steve. So uh, I think, you know, given that it doesn't, as you say, it doesn't trigger the automatic, if it's public, it triggers the automatic. 
Yeah, because public kind of verification. Yeah, because public already has a process from day one, yeah. from two years ago. Two years ago, when add-ons became a living thing, right? So, so that that's so, and we'll talk in a second about the verification process outside of add-ons. So there there is a a separate form for you to fill in, uh, and there's a couple of requirements uh, for that as well. Um, so just moving on. So that was verification for add-ons. Now for web apps and other other deployments. So um, this is you know if you publish a web app, or if um, you have a container-bound script, so something attached to a document, uh, a spreadsheet, or a form, or whatever. Uh, so the script is part of that document, and you you know one way, kind of the original way of distributing those. Um, uh, before we had add-ons was just to give anyone view access and they would make a copy of it. Um, so this is kind of the matrix of what what's going to trigger uh, uh, an authentication flow. Um, I should uh, my understanding of this is uh, you'll only get the unverified authentication flow if you're hitting certain scopes. Wrong on that. So uh, I'm getting a nod from Steve. So. Um, if if your script isn't using certain scopes, um, then you, you'll just get the normal auth authentication flow. Um, so what this is showing is if you, if you published uh, a web app um, or other deployment using a Gmail account and it's using a sensitive scope, you are going to get the un unverified auth flow. So um, it, there, there's there's no way around that. So um and the first column or or the second column uh you know is if if you go through the uh the verification process so uh you, you just get the, the normal you still have to get people to to click you know their account and to accept the scopes but they don't get that scary uh this is an unsafe or unverified app um, within uh, g suite uh, there's uh, uh, a couple of things so um, if you're publishing something in your G, G Suite domain and it's used by another G Suite user in your domain, they're not going to get the unverified authentication. It's only when you go outside of your G Suite domain that you're, you're going to have to start looking at if you want to um, get your app verified. So I don't know if there's anything either you want to add to that or correct me if I've got anything of that wrong. Um, well, the only thing that comes to mind, and I don't know the answer, is if you have a client that has subdomains, uh, mm. I'm not sure how this table is affected. Um, uh, so for example, if I have a primary domain and uh, the normal, af normal authorization flow occurs, but what if now I'm branching out to the row number two that's um, account not of customer A. In other words, it's a subdomain. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe uh, it's fine. Maybe subdomains are fine. I, I don't know yet. Yeah, well, I'll maybe see if we can get a comment on that one. Um, it's not something I know. Uh, Wakar, I don't know if it's something you no. Um uh, <laughs> no, Actually, uh, I have not followed much this, uh, this issue. So no, right. I'm not much aware about it. So, um, if I just quick, so if I jump back, so there, there is when we should sort of just talk off. There was this kind of you you could still use an uh, an unverified app, but you had to click on the advanced and then do the unsafe thing. Um, so users can do that, but there is a cap of, on the number of users that can uh, basically click on you know do that process. I haven't seen any numbers on what the cap is. Um, I don't know, Steve. You've you've seen anything on this? Uh, it just reminds me that before the uh, authorization flow was implemented shortly ago, before that, the cap was more noticeable. Uh, yeah. But since they started this process, it's kind of supposed to be replacing it. Um, so hopefully, that's more of a minor thing. What we're talking about now with the uh, cap, yeah. but we'll see. I, and yes, so in the web app, uh, we'll come on to this in a second. Um, there was a, a whole, if you published the web app, there was only, so I think it was 50 users a day. Um, but um, whether it's the same number, it's uh, a slightly different 
cap we're talking about here. Um, so again, that might gray area. Perhaps we'll get some comment on that uh, or clarify. Um, so shortly after um, Google did the kind of uh, push notifying users about this, um, Wesley Chun, who's a developer relations at Google, uh, posted on the, the Google Plus community. So um, just clarifying a couple of things. So uh, the first thing um, he mentioned was that the un uh, unverified app flow um, only kicks in for sensitive scopes. So Google haven't published a list of sensitive scopes. Um, and I'm guessing they're, that they haven't published it because it's it's not a fixed list. That it'll probably change over time. Um, but doing a quick test within the script editor, um, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago now, so this might be out of date. But these were the scopes I found that were causing um, the unverified app flow. So if you include these scopes within your script project, then uh, and if you're publishing it as a web app, distributing it as a container bound, um, or doing uh, an unlisted add on, these were the scopes that were, were triggering your on unverified applications. There was, um, I've included a couple of surprise ones. So um, spreadsheets, slides and docs, um, I could kind of see, you know, because um, these scopes are quite broad. They allow um, um, writing and uh, reading of data that they're not uh, usually restricted. Um, Formap was fine. Uh, similarly, Gmail, whilst is a um, a scope that needs you to go through a verification process, uh, Mail app wasn't. Um, so there's some interesting variations in there. I don't know, Steve, you've got any comment on that? Yeah, I'm glad you went through that exercise. It's, it helps us to figure out what is sensitive. Um, yeah. Now, one thing with Mail app, I believe that's more of a like a read-only type of uh, uh, yeah. service where Gmail app allows you to do updates. Instead. Yeah. So I can see the differences there. One other thing, so this was this came off the back of um, a post I think you were contributing, Steve, on uh, in the uh, um, the G Suite add-on developer community was um, uh, one of the things that you can do is you can restrict the scopes within your projects by using the only current document uh, annotation. So um, what this does is means that if you're using any of these listed scopes, which are um, currently sensitive um, by using only current doc, you you negate that. So because it's limited to a, a single document, um, it, it, you don't you don't get into the unverified app flow. Um, so this was actually a godsend for me because one of my most popular projects is a a Google Sheet with a, a container bound script, so it's not an add on. Uh, so by using only current doc in that script, um, people can use that as as previously without the uh, unverified app flow. And that's probably something else just to mention that when you're distributing something as a container-bound script, um, you can't actually get that verified because it's a container-bound script. And when someone makes a copy of it, basically they would have to get their copy verified themselves. Um, so you can't get a template verified. Um, so that's that's something just to be aware of. But I suppose less people are doing container bound stuff. Are you, Steve, are you still doing container bound distribution? Well, it's interesting. Uh, this particular add on for this client that was approved, uh, he has a report segment. And the report is basically using a spreadsheet. So I said, well, we could simply create a, a spreadsheet, make it like a template, and we'll copy the template that contains yeah. the contained app script that has a custom menu of like two items. So it was very simple and basic. I thought, okay, great. But as you pointed out, as soon as you make a copy of a spreadsheet in this case that contains an app script, it's considered new. Yeah. And you have the verification yes. issue. So uh, that probably means in this use case, we need to use an add-on for yeah. something that's very, very simple. But that yes. it gets around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm 
glad to hear I'm not the only one that's distributing container bound script, but I am moving to an add-on. Don't worry, folks, I'll, I will eventually get around to the add-on. Um, so just back to the post from uh, Wesley Tune. So existing apps are not affected. Um, so if I can't remember, I think this was um, 21st of July. Uh, yeah, it was or, or, uh, 19th of July or something. It was around early mid July that this came out. So yeah, have you yeah, I think it was the 18th and it's not affected yet is a key word. Uh, <laughs> so it, it may be a, a big experience to start going through all the existing yeah. ones. But as of now, they're for anything new. So yeah. Um, so uh, the other thing was the per day um, authorization for throttling was a temporary measure and it's been rolled back in favor of an unverified app cap. So what I think this means or is referring to is this was something else that um, Steve, you contributed on was the 10 web apps, uh, new authorization limits. So this was something that appeared in the documentation and now I, I can't find it anymore. So I'm, I'm guessing this is what um, uh, Wesley was referring to that uh, publishing as a web app um, is, is not restricted now to to the quotas that were there for, for a, uh, exactly a yeah, yeah that's what I was referring to about this new verification process like July 18th whatever yeah it's kind of kind of replacing this so um, but there, there's that mention of a cap for even with with the unverified app uh, cap um, but there's doesn't seem to be any documentation on that so uh, we'll try and get clarification. Um, I think the last thing you have public facing app scripts uh, go through the verification process to, to remove the unverified web app warning. So quickly, what does that look like? Um, so uh, there are a couple of requirements for verification. So, um, and uh, this is for uh, a standalone web app uh, or our script project. So this is, uh, as mentioned earlier, add-ons. It's it's integrated into public add-on process. So I'm, I'm guessing, Steve, some of this looks familiar for you in terms of the submission you did. So um, for a requirement for verification, is uh, the first thing is that you have a, a domain that is verified ownership of Google. So um, this is a, a website domain um was that something that i suppose was that already within the add-ons verification process that you needed that um not really um the original verification process with add-ons wasn't particularly interested in having a domain to be verified but now i believe that is the case mm -hmm. so with this client that i referred to we did have a G Suite business account, you know, the one that you pay ten dollars a month per user for that level, mm -hmm. and we, so that was good. Check off, and then we did spend a lot of time to create a nice privacy policy. So those are the things that I think is why we had a successful approval. Uh, so yeah, the, the second so uh, a website. So if you're a G Suite customer, I'd imagine you you're, you're going to have a domain owned anywhere. Uh, um, but it, it, there needs to be a, a public facing website where on your verified domain, you can put your privacy policy. Um, so uh, those are the, the two things that you need. There's various other bits and pieces that you need um, to provide. So information on the, the scopes that you're using and why you're using them. Um, but there's more documentation on that on, on the website. So. Um, more bits and pieces for you to have to do as a Google Apps Script developer if you want to uh, publish web apps, um, add-ons, um, or or other uh, script projects um, that that are using these sensitive um, scopes. Um, but um, Steve, anything else yeah. you'd like to? Add? Yeah, I mean, generally, um, there's a group of app scripters, if you want to call it call it that, where some of us are kind of like you know the hackers where hey I just have a Gmail account I just want to create these things and it's, um, maybe it's for a few people 
And, but it's almost like we really should take the next professional step to say, you know what, I better create a domain. I better professionalize this a little bit more uh, because for the sake of uh, the end user safety with phishing attacks. So that's a transition that in the app script community that I think we, we really need to accept and hold, you know, embrace to say we really need to be, become more professional by having a uh, professional domain that can be verified. Um, I've, I know Jonathan's back. Is, is there anything you want to ask or add to the? I think to... I've been, yeah, I've been following this a little bit because I've uh, a, a latent fear that I'm going to be <laughs> deluged with. Um, <laughs> all of my prototype projects that I've got running for both my company and a bunch of others are suddenly not working and, and the, sort of the headaches of late night calls of why isn't it working. Um, most of the add-ons that I produce end up being uh, registered directly only to a G Suite domain. I don't do really anything public facing but, um, but bespoke tools for uh, private enterprise. So I'm hoping that I'm less likely to be touched with it, but I haven't really worked out from the documentation whether that is the case. Um, so that's that's my hope, but the fear is that I've not, um, I mean, one way around it is to have a sort of a common OAuth project in the developer portal and kind of have that authorized, and then have a whole load of uh, app scripts that only refer to that single OAuth um, uh, console project that would be a one way of managing the fact that I've got lots and lots and lots of these uh, little things running uh, and to try and uh, bring those into an alignment probably. So Jonathan you're saying you're not impacted yet but you're wondering if you will be. I, I'm Yes I've, I've certainly been following it with interest I haven't had any notification everything that I've worked on still works and um, I don't know whether you know when that will happen if it will happen and that's what's been Unclear, I think. Uh, does your company use subdomains by any chance? No, we don't. Okay, I was just curious. We think you'd be safe if you're mostly working in a domain environment, so you're you're publishing mm -hmm. stuff just for a G Suite set of domain users. Um, so far, that that the, you you seem to be taking the requirements and not needing to go through the verification process. It's only if something that's older and it was. Done yeah. doing something with some scope that somehow isn't yeah. linked to it, because there are some scopes that are definitely linked to uh, G Suite Enterprise, you know, SLA uh, service level agreements, and they're definitely bound in. And there are some things that sometimes mm -hmm. you borrow on and bring in, and I, I can't remember. You know, I haven't kept track, de detailed track of everything, and it's the older ones that I'm kind of worried about. But we'll, we'll see. The the other question I had, which I haven't got uh, a good answer yet. Is what happens with libraries? So, mm. if you if you get a library verified, does the if the the script project that uses that library does that her inherit the verification? Um, and what happens if that library changes? And uh, you know, it might not be your library. You could be using a third party library. Um, I I haven't I've asked this question and I haven't got a response. Uh, I don't know. If anyone else here has asked a similar question, it's yeah. a good so, question. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know because the library yeah. itself isn't isn't actually were running ever. So you know that that library code could contain all sorts of yeah. Uh, the, the 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 response I got was um, I was told to consider the script project to basically. Consider it as inheriting all the code from the library into the script project. So, mm. um, if even if the library was verified, um, I would still need to get the script project verified. Um, but uh, I mean, line one of page one of the add-on says, "Don't use libraries." So yeah. maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe this was coming <laughs> over the hill some for some time. <laughs> so we're all kind of. Um, Rolling with the punches here and just seeing where it goes. I, I, I agree with Steve. I think in terms of creating uh, an environment that you know people are confident in using, I, I think it, it, it's perhaps needed. Um, there's some of the details that you know the 
for example, the unverified app screen, for me, it looks too much like a SSL certificate error free page that you get with you in your browser. And I don't know if that level of fear is needed. Perhaps it is, um, given that you know phishing attacks can be quite destructive. Perhaps we need need that level of fear, similar to a bad um, SSL cer certificate. Mm. And um, well, that's that's what we had on app verification. It's as I mentioned that um, whilst a lot of the dust has settled, I think there's still more things to be worked out. Um, and we look forward to the contributions from the community, the things that they discover, um, questions they have uh, on this particular topic. And with that, I don't think we've got anything more unless any um, we have any final questions uh, or thoughts. Yeah, I do have one thing I just want to follow up on that we mentioned in the previous broadcast. I guess I should share my screen. Do that right now. Um, there's also a effort to say if I'm an admin and let's say I use the G Suite Marketplace and I bring over or install a solution and application on behalf of all my users in the domain. Um, there's another level of authorization that's possible now in the control panel to say, well, I may only want to authorize um, spreadsheets, uh, not necessarily drive. And if someone turns that on at the, the administrator to kind of restrict it, um, it's possible that you may have an add-on that was installed by that administrator and the end user is getting an error. And and then that could get back to the, the developer of the add-on. And so this is a post that was um, out there. And supposedly, what the error message should say is to say, contact your administrator. Uh, don't contact the developer of the add-on. So I just wanted to highlight that if you have an add-on and you're getting some sort of permission that errors that you may be trapping yourself, uh, you should be no action on your part there should have been a message for the end user to contact their administrator that they need to turn on that Google Drive or whatever. Um, so that's how it's supposed to flow. So just to recap that, um, if uh, so, uh, an admin's done a domain-wide deploy of an add-on, but they haven't switched uh, one of the permissions on, um, it, it, it's throwing an error message. Yeah, or let's say the other use case that before this new opportunity of tightening down authorizations by service, that uh, maybe a thousand people within the domain have been using your add-on, then all of a sudden the next yeah. day uh, they're getting an error, and it's because the admin says, "Oh, there's a new tightening down service by service levels, right?" And if they un and they said, "Well, no one should have access to Drive," all of a sudden <laughs> they get an error. So that, that could be another use case. Uh, Jonathan, I know you do a lot of uh, domain-wide deploy. I suppose that's less of an issue because you're talking to the administrators correctly. You, usually, but people change. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and it and, and, um, depends on who gets these notifications. So if, uh, basically, as Steve was saying, if someone gets a notification, oh, I can now have all exercise all this control and fine tune and I'll be the, the rock star super security guy and then suddenly they break a whole bunch of spaghetti code way way back in there. Um, yeah there's, there's always that risk and these things these things do happen. So um, I think um, we're actually going to finish um, on time for once. Yay. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd just like to uh, thank Waikara for um, his contributions to today's show. So um, as mentioned, we'll, we'll um, provide links to his slides and we'll, we'll have an edited version as well um, of, of the video, so you can watch that back at your pleasure. Um, thank you to um, Steve as well for his support in today's episode and Jonathan um, for your contribution. Thank you.